If you will, go ahead and turn with me to Genesis chapter 13. And we're going to be there in a few minutes. I'm going to actually quote from three other scriptures before that, but we're not going to turn there. They're short. And if you want to jot them down, I'll give you the scripture reference. But we will all be together in Genesis chapter 13 in a few moments. I don't ever apologize for the word because the word is, the word of God is good. Amen. Amen. We, who can bring charge against God or his word? We can't. Um, sometimes he leads us to a word that's a warning. And so I've asked for your full attention this morning. You say, well, we're the faithful. Yes, you're the faithful. And it's the faithful that the enemy goes after the harvest. Because he wants to bring, bring you down and destroy your witness and your testimony for the Lord. And so, just ask that you would listen with an open heart this morning. A warning for Christians. The friendship that will damn you. The friendship that will damn you. Father, I come before your throne this morning and I ask, Lord God, that you would just help me, Lord God, to set aside all personal feelings, to set aside everything that would hinder me in the bringing forth of this word. I ask, Lord God, that you would put the word that you have ordained within my heart, my mouth, my lips in this hour, Lord God, and take away everything that's not of you, Lord God. Lord, in this final hour, in this time in which we are living, Lord God, we need to know how it is that you would desire for us to live, and we need to know the things that are hindering. And I ask, Lord God, that there would be not one person here today, Lord, who would shut out your word. Lord, that your word would be so strong and so powerful, Lord God, not because of the way I deliver it, but, Lord, because of your Holy Spirit, that you would drive it like a nail into their hearts. Lord, that you would use it as Jeremiah says, that it's a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces. So I pray, Lord God, for this word to be like a hammer that breaks the hardness of hearts, Lord God, and would wake us up, Lord God, to the state of our soul, Lord, before it's too late. So I ask, Lord God, for your help, for your aid, for your anointing, to do that which I cannot do in my own strength. Lord Jesus, may you be glorified and lifted up in this word, and I thank you for all the fruit that you will bring forth because of it in Jesus' mighty Holy and wonderful name we pray, Jesus of Nazareth. Amen. There's great mixture, and you're all aware of it, in the church world today. It is difficult for many people in many areas to find a church that preaches the Word of God. That even preaches, you may, you may have never seen this, it may shock you. There are places where it's hard to find a church where the Bible is preached. Right. Not just preached accurately but where the Bible is even preached. And there are places today where the social agenda is more important than the Word of God. There are churches today where pastors are inviting transgenders to come and stand in the pulpit and tell their story because they put their hand of approval to a lifestyle that God has not condoned. Same thing with many other other things that I could mention, but that's not what the message is about. We, we just happen to live in this hour and live in the heart of this culture in which we are surrounded by these things that press in upon us every day and wear us down, wear us down. You know, the Bible says that in the end times that Satan will seek to wear out the saints of God, to wear out the saints of God. And one of the ways that he wears you out is by getting your attention off of the sufficiency of Christ and onto the things of the world around you in such a way that you hear it over and over and over again and it chips away at your convictions. It chips away at the things that you know are right and are wrong to the point that you begin to compromise upon the Word and upon the things that you have known, even from childhood, some of you concerning the things of God. We find a good example when we look at our own homes and our television sets. How many times have we spoken years ago, horrified at some of the things that we're seeing being promoted on television, and we would think that we would never even look at those things, that we would never let them 
enter our eyes. And now we find that we become desensitized to so many things that we will tolerate it. And we will watch. And then we not only begin to watch, but our sympathies, and I'll come back to this in a moment, our sympathies begin to be with those who live in a way that is rebellious against the Lord. And so the warning today is about a place that sucks you in. It's about a place that's like a whirlpool. If you've ever seen a picture of a whirlpool in the ocean and a boat gets caught in it, or a, a strong riptide that will carry you away without you even realizing at first that you're caught in its pull and it will take you away from shore into a place of destruction. We find that we drift and we drift and then we're caught in something, and it so draws us, it draws our hearts, it begins to draw our very affections to the point that we aren't even uh, strong anymore in the things that we once were strong in. These first three scriptures that I said we're not going to turn to. First John 2.15 says, Love not the world, nor the things in the world. For the things in the world are not of the Father. Love not the world, nor the things in the world. Just that part of that verse. Love not the world, that means the world system. Love not this world system, nor the things in the world that we tend to be gravitating towards and attracted to more than the love of God, more than the Word of God. Love not the world. Sometimes we gloss over these things. We read these verses and we don't think they apply to us. As I said in the beginning, Satan is after the strongest of God's people. You think, well, I'm the faithful. Yes, but he is the one, you are the very one that he wants to take down. He wants to wear you out with these things. James 4.4 4 says, friendship with the world is enmity with God. Friendship with the world. Now, this is going to be something that we're going to come back to repeatedly this morning. But I want to give you another translation or another word for enmity in that scripture. James 4.4 4, Friendship with the world is hostility towards God. Think about this for a moment. If you find that the world is more important to you and being accepted by the world and the people in the world and the things in the world crowd into your life and it's more important to you than the things of God. Friendship of the world is hostility towards God. Hostility towards God. This is a, a shocking statement to me when we read it plainly. Romans 8, 7 says... Because the carnal mind, that means the natural, unrenewed mind, flesh, self. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. Again, that word. The carnal mind is enmity against God. It is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. In other words, in your own strength, your natural mind, you can't think the thoughts of God. You can't walk with the Lord in your own strength. Your own mind, it takes a born-again mind that is being renewed in the Word of God to be able to understand spiritual things, see spiritual realities, and walk with God. But the heart of that verse, again, Romans 8, 7, because the carnal mind is enmity or hostility against God. Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah... And in the days of Lot, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. You've heard that many times. And many times we've compared it with the days of Noah. That people are going about business as usual. And it was a time of great wickedness and turning away from the things that they knew to be right. And the Bible says that the imagination of man's heart was continually wicked. The imagination of man's heart was continually wicked. All you have to do is watch the news these days. And you see that the imagination, the things that people are coming up with, that they are dreaming up to even make laws concerning, are hostile to the things of God. Hostility against God, and it's unbelievable. But we don't talk as often about what. 
We only think of Lot, Sodom and Gomorrah, and homosexuality when we think of Lot's name. But it goes a lot deeper than that. You're going to see that that is only the tip of an iceberg. In Genesis 13, beginning with verse 8 through 13, we find the beginning of Lot's journey to the city of Sodom. Where did it begin? What was the what precipitated this move of Lot? So beginning with verse 8, So Abram said to Lot, Please let there be no strife between you and me, and between my herdsmen and your herdsmen, for we are brethren. Is not the whole land before you? Please separate from me. If you take the left, then I will go to the right. Or if you go to the right, then I will go to the left. And Lot lifted his eyes and saw all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as you go towards Zoar. Then Lot chose for himself all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated from each other. Abram dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent even as far as Sodom. I want you to underline this phrase. <clears throat> Even as far as Sodom. It's a significant phrase in this passage. Even as far as Sodom. But the men of Sodom were exceedingly wicked and sinful against the Lord. Exceedingly wicked and sinful against the Lord. We find in this passage of scripture that Uncle Abraham and nephew Lot have lived in the same place together as a clan, and each one has their own herd, servants, and families, and they have grown to where it's too much for them to dwell together. Their herdsmen are fighting one another, and Abram says, let's separate into two different places. And we find in this one little passage, the spiritual man and the natural man, or the carnal man. Or the soulish man, which is a biblical word. In other words, the soul, your mind, your will, and your emotions. That part of you which can be ruled either by the Holy Spirit or by self, by flesh. And so with Lot, he was a man in which his own soul was dominant. dominant. Not God's Holy Spirit working through him, but his own soul. He wanted what he wanted. Lot was self-motivated, self-directed, self-governed, and everything that you can find that the word self could be attached to. And yet he was part of the covenant people of God. We'll see in a moment, you know, the New Testament says that he was a righteous man. And we read this story and we think, how can he be a righteous man? But there are many believers who are righteous because they have put their faith in Christ. And they're righteous because... You know, you've heard me say before, it doesn't matter. It does matter, but it's not as important how you run the race, it's how you finish the race. And I've always said that because, in other words, your past is done with. Let it be in the past, and Jesus' blood washes that away. What matters now is how you finish. How do you finish? You can, you can uh, redeem the time, as the Bible says. And you can finish strong with the Lord. But Lot was a man who, we're going to see so much compromise here, but in the end he obeyed. In the end there was enough faith that he followed the angels, even though they had to really strongly urge and pull at him to get him out of the city. But nevertheless, he followed the Lord and he believed in the Lord enough that, you know, faith is counted to us as righteousness. But you can be a person of faith, and you can at the same time let your natural mind become dominant. You can walk after your own ways and you can compromise with things that you know to be wrong. You can make room in your life for friendship with the world and you can bring about a destruction that in the end, people will ask the question that some of you have asked before because we don't understand God's free will and His sovereignty over our lives 
And I don't believe it's meant for us to fully understand it. Therefore, in the end, we ask the question concerning certain people. Well, I don't understand. Were they never saved in the first place? Were they never saved in the first place? Or were they saved and they just kept toying with the things that they shouldn't have? And so we're going to see this play out in just a moment. And in it, a strong warning for you and I. And so a question arises as they separate. Because Lot, Lot is the, the, the soulish man and he chooses what looks good to his natural eyes. And here's Abraham, the spiritual man. The spiritual man is saying, you, you choose Lot. I'll take second best. That's a good picture of the spiritual man. You go first. You choose. I will sacrifice for you. I will go, I will take second place. I will play second fiddle. I don't mind not being in the limelight. I don't mind remaining in the shadows. I just want to follow God. That's the spiritual man. And so the question arises, why would a man raised in the shadow of such a great man of faith as Abram who becomes Abraham why would a man raised in that environment who's seen the hand of God, who's seen an example, a godly example all of his life of a man who has followed God out of idolatry and into this incredible relationship with God? Why would a man who has come up in such a manner and in such a place, in such a relationship, Why would he be drawn, so drawn as to separate from that uncle and to move into a region? There were five cities. The cities of Sodom and Gomorrah were only two out of five. They're called in this this story the cities of the plain. Why would he be drawn out out of the culture? I'm going to use this word over and over. Out of the culture of the godly uncle that raised him, basically, or was with him all of that time, why would he be drawn? Why would his eyes find it more attractive to choose to move upon these five cities where the culture was wicked, cruel, vicious, and against the things of God, where perversion reigned supreme, and everyone was out for their own selves? Five-city region. And out of the five, the Bible says, listen to this again, out of the five cities, even as far as Sodom, even as far as Sodom, it says in verse 12, Abram dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lot, listen to this, maybe you've not noticed this before, and Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain, There were five of them. And pitched his tent even as far as Sodom. This tells me that Lot moved around. He was used to being a nomad before this. Lot moved around and he went from one city to another. Five cities in all. And the Bible says he lived in those cities. Apparently over time. They were all wicked. But then the Bible singles out, we know in other places it singles out Sodom and Gomorrah together as exceedingly wicked. And here it says, eventually, I'm going to paraphrase it, eventually he pitched his tent, not just in the five cities which were wicked enough, but even as far as Sodom, which was exceedingly wicked. Even as far as Sodom, I think that the Holy Spirit goes to great lengths and strong use of words to indicate to us how bad it was. That Lot moved. I I can't even... How does a man who is raised in Abraham's household end up going from city to city and it's like one city is not bad enough? And yet the New Testament says it troubled him. It vexed his soul, the things that he saw. And yet he couldn't get, he could, it's like a, a vortex that just drew him in. He found something that 
appeal to him in those wicked cities. And he preferred, listen to me, beloved, it's no different than the Christian today who grows up in the church, who grows up around family, who knows God, who grows up in the, in the household of faith, who grows up and sees the example of godly people who walk with God and who have answered prayer in their lives. They know that God's hand is truly upon the ones around them, and yet there's something so appealing to them in the world that they prefer the company. You see what's happened in this scene. He prefers the company of the wicked people of Sodom over the company of the godly family of which he has been a part. When you look at today at what's happened, and I'll just use churches as the example, and you hear in the last week or two or whenever about whether it's homosexuals being ordained to preach in the pulpit or whether it's a transgender being invited to read stories to children and children's hour at the church, not just the libraries. That's what's happening. And you think, well, they're done for. It's, it's so wicked. It's so far gone. But you've got to understand it's the tip of the iceberg. That's the tip of the iceberg. You know, an iceberg has far more volume underneath the water than just the little tip that you see on top. And we, we recoil in horror at what we see the tip that's exposed now because we've already become accustomed to all the things that have gone before that are just part of that giant iceberg. In other words, when a person is so comfortable with wicked, wicked, wicked lifestyles and they, as a believer, they begin to find that they would rather have their company there. And we see them perhaps compromise or do something that makes us think, oh, how could they do that? That is only the tip of an iceberg that began long before. They've slowly drifted. They've slowly come to this place. When your secret loyalty or even open, when your loyalty with those aspects of our culture that are adamantly opposed to God, when your loyalty with those things becomes evident, you've already been drifting long before and you've been a friend of the things of the world. You have found yourself more comfortable with those who are not named among the people of God. You've made friendship with the other four cities. You see, before Lot ever made friends in Sodom, he made friends in the other four cities. Before it ever got as bad as the rampant homosexuality among the men in Sodom, he had already become comfortable in the other four cities. And you find yourself with loyalties that violate the Word of God. Friendship with things that are contrary to the Word of God. You've already made friendship with lots of other things before you would ever even come to that place. When we're introduced to this part of Lot's life, the Lord in his recording of his life moves forward. We're not going to read the next portion, but in the last of chapter 18, we find that God reveals to Abraham his plan to destroy these five cities, and especially Sodom. But before we get to that, and again, we're not going to read it, Abraham is revealed to us in a little more depth, and so is Lot. Because Lot has moved somewhere that he doesn't belong. He gets in trouble. Remember, he, he, he's captured with the people of Sodom by this five-king coalition that comes in and takes all of their property and carries them off into captivity and Uncle Abraham, with his vast army of servants, goes and rescues him, and he goes right back to Sodom, where he was. He gets in trouble. He's not under the he's not under the umbrella of the blessing of God. There's a breach in the hedge of protection that would have been around his life. He's carried away into a place of captivity. And meanwhile, God begins to speak to Abram again talking to him about the covenant. 
a covenant that would affect people for all of eternity. That Abram will become the father of nations. And through him all the people of the earth would be blessed. And so we see that Lot gets in trouble. Abram walks with God. Abram walks with God. A picture of the spiritual man. Turn with me to chapter 19. Beginning with verses 1 through 3. We now look in upon Lot and his life in Sodom. Now the two angels came to Sodom in the evening. And Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. When Lot saw them, he rose to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. And he said, Here now, my lords, please turn in to your servant's house and spend the night, and wash your feet, that you may rise early and go on your way. And they said, No, but we will spend the night in the open square. But he insisted strongly, so they turned into him and entered his house. Then he made them a feast and baked unleavened bread, and they ate. The Bible tells us these are angels, but they come as men who are travelers. And they come to the city, and Lot, he is still a man who knows right from wrong, and he is like so many, he can recognize that something is from God. And yet there is confusion in his walk with God. Because of his love for worldly things, he cannot make right decisions. Follow me for just a moment. When there is compromise in these things in our lives, we we know that God is in something. We know perhaps we're still in the church and we come and we can rejoice when we see, maybe we see somebody come to the Lord and they're baptized and their life is being changed. And we rejoice. We truly rejoice to see this happening in their life. We still recognize that certain things are from God. And yet, we're spiritually confused. There's confusion in our minds and in our hearts. We we can't make godly, spiritual decisions because our affections are misplaced. Our affections are not with the pure, righteous things of God, our affections are with those in the world around us that we have become sympathetic with. And we look at them and we think, well, they're not so bad. And we build up all their good qualities, but we refuse to think or speak the truth concerning what God's Word says. And so these are angelic beings, whether Lot sees them as angels at first, I don't know, but he knows that they are travelers, and God's Word says that you're to take them in and take care of them and help them on their way. It was a part of what God had instructed for His people in that day. In verses 4 through 8, Now before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both old and young, all the people from every quarter, surrounded the house. You know this story. And they called to Lot and said to him, Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may know them carnally. So Lot went out to them through the doorway, shut the door behind him, and said, Please, my brethren, do not do so wickedly. He knows this is wrong. It's interesting. We find in the first, the first verse that we read in this chapter, he's sitting at the city gate. The city gate is where the elders of the city sit. It's where the leaders of the city make decisions. And their lot is among the leadership of this city that permits such wicked things to take place. A society where basically all of the men are given over to perversion. And this is the company he keeps. And this is where he is recognized as someone of importance there in the gate of the city. Now he's trying to tell them, after he's lived there with them all of this time, and they're doing it every single day, every night, all around him, now he tries to speak up and say, don't do this wicked thing. I want want you to think for a moment about you in the workplace, you among your friends. And I want you to think about those times that you've been silent for so long, And the people around you that you basically 
have befriended are living lifestyles that are absolutely immoral and contrary to the Word of God, and you've never said a word, and then maybe, maybe some time comes that they do something, or you finally have to speak up. And when you do, you would think, oh, I've earned their respect after all of this time. Look at their, look at how they respond. See now, I have, now listen to this, it, it gets worse. See now, I have two daughters who have not known a man. Please let me bring them out to you, and you may do to them as you wish. Only do nothing to these men, since this is the reason they have come under the shadow of my roof. I said, you may recognize certain things are right or wrong in that state, but you cannot make right decisions. You make wrong, stupid decisions when you're acting in a carnal mind and you're supposed to be one who belongs to the Lord. So he tries to tell them they're wrong. Then he does a terrible thing and offers them his daughters. But then how do they respond? After all of his sitting in the gate with them, all of his being a, <clears throat> I can get along with everybody. You know, I, I'm not, not going to ruffle their feathers. I will become their friend and one day maybe I will be able to have influence and lead them to the Lord. Well, he has influence. He is sat in the gate. He's there among the leaders of the city. And now he tries to tell them something is evil. And they said, in verse 9, stand back. Then they said, this one came in to stay here, and he keeps acting as a judge. Now we will deal worse with you than with them. So they pressed hard against the man Lot, and came near to break down the door. But the men reached out their hands, and the men being the angels, reached out their hands and pulled Lot into the house with them and shut the door. And they struck the men who were at the doorway of the house with blindness, both small and great, so that they became weary trying to find the door. We see that Lot has no wisdom. He has no spiritual power. His loyalties are divided. And he cannot even make right decisions. In verse 9, in the end, the wicked, I want you to understand this is something that I want to show you today and I want you to understand. When you have sympathies with the world, when you have befriended those, I know that those of you who are listening to me hear that I'm not speaking to empty air. And I know that there are those listening who will listen on the internet who will know exactly in their own life what God is speaking to. You have befriended the enemy. You have befriended those who have not been called friends of God. Your loyalties are divided. You've made allegiances. The Bible talks about this. You have made covenants. You've made relationships. Deep relationships. I'm not talking about a relationship of trying to win someone to the Lord. You have found your satisfaction in relationships with people of the world. And in the end, when you try to lead them and you try to tell them something is wrong, in the end, when you're finally pressed into a corner and your faith must come up and stand, if it does at all, they will have no sympathy for you. There will be no sympathy for you. And then I will ask you these questions. Why do you get so offended? Why do you get so offended when those in the world treat you, they spurn you when you try to speak to them concerning something of a matter of faith? Why is it? Let the Lord shine a light deep into the depths of your heart this morning. Why do you want their acceptance? Why do you need their acceptance? Why do you want to fit in with that crowd? Why do you value their opinion and spurn the covenant of God? The Lord went to the cross for you to make covenant with you. He purchased you. Your life is not your own. You belong to Him, the Word of God says. 
And he says to you this morning, why do you want the world's acceptance when you have mine? Amen. Why do you value their opinions and spurn my covenant? That's right. In verse 10, these angelic beings, they reach out because Lot is in over his head. And they grab him by the arm and they draw him back in and they shut the door and they blind the men of the city. They strike them with blindness. Grace is still operating in Lot's life. Amen. Grace is still operating in his life to draw him back into, let's put this in a spiritual picture for us today, to draw him back into the house of God. Shut in with the presence of God. These angelic beings represent the presence of God now in his own house. And he's drawn back into this place where wickedness is shut out and it's seen for what it is. And all of his friendship with them has gotten him no favor with them on this evil night. But there's a magnetism. There's a magnetism that the world has for many believers. It draws them every single day. It draws them. And for all of us, there are things around us in the world that the enemy wants to use to charm us, to draw our affections away from God and towards the things of this world. Verse 11 is such a picture of what we see rising all around us. The wicked men of the city surround the house of the man of God and they're demanding to have their way. They're not just saying any longer, we want to be tolerated. We want to be accepted in this society. Now they're saying, you must not only accept us, but you must participate. And you must agree. In verse 12, then the men said to Lot, have you anyone else here, son-in-law, your sons, your daughters and whomever you have in the city, take them out of this place, for we will destroy this place, because the outcry against them has grown great before the face of the Lord. And the Lord has sent us to destroy it. So Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-law who had married his daughters and said, Get up, get out of this place, for the Lord, Lord will destroy this city. Now he's, he's prophesying to his sons-in-law. He's bringing them a warning. Get up, get out of this place, for the Lord will destroy the city. But to his sons-in-law, he seemed to be joking. He has lost all testimony, even in his own family. When your friendship is with the world, you know, this is something that I see all the time in ministry. And I'm not saying it condemningly, I'm saying it rescuingly. How many of you have convictions about things? This, I believe, according to the Word of God, is wrong. This is a conviction. I would never do such and such, and I will not give my eyes to this thing or that thing. I will not enter into relationship in this type of aspect and let people think that I condone it or that I approve of it. Maybe you had that conviction five years ago or ten years ago, and now you find you have... Come into a place where those lines have all become blurred. What is a conviction? My friends, what is a conviction? A conviction is not an opinion that changes this year or next year. A conviction is something that you find that God burns into your heart from the Word of God and nothing can make you deviate from it. If you deviate from it, then it wasn't a conviction. That's right. It was a momentary opinion. I want to know. I want you to think. I don't need to know. I want, I want you to know. What convictions do you have left as the people of God? What are you willing to go to your grave and say, this was worth dying for? You know, we like the little phrase, we talk about with our kids and different ones. Uh, I'm not willing to die on that hill. Pick your battles carefully. That's true. But when it comes to the Word of God, what hill are you willing to die on? 
What battle are you willing to fight? What I see happening in the church today, and it will overtake my own soul if I'm not, if I'm not careful. What I see happening in the church today is we are shrinking back in silence. We're shrinking back in silence and we just want to live quietly and not really identify ourselves because there's such a hostility arising now because of what we believe. And we, we don't want to speak about those things because people won't like us and people may attack us. We may be ostracized and we may be forced into places that are very uncomfortable for us. But what is worth it? What is worth the price He paid on the cross for us? Grace is still reaching out to you. Amen. Grace is still reaching out to you. If you're within the sound of my voice, grace is still reaching out to you, saying, get into the house, be shut in with the presence of God and the people of God. Shut the door to the world and its magnetism. Recognize it for what it is. Such a picture of where we are today. Lot's testimony has been lost. You know, I don't know if you remember this, but in the book of Acts, the apostles got together and they decided on just, as the Gentiles were coming to the Lord, they weren't under Judaism. And they needed time to be taught and to learn and they needed to understand the difference between the Old Testament law and what applied to them and what didn't as Gentiles. And so they were given just three simple things. You know, it had to do with not eating things given to idols, no sexual immorality, and no partaking of blood. Just things that would really be biggies. I believe as we're entering, it's not that it's all you need to know to be a Christian. But as we're entering this time that we're living in right now as we go forward, there are three things I want to challenge you with that I believe the Lord gave me. Three things, and it's not the main message, so I'm going to go through it real quick. I want to give you three things the Lord has given me that I believe you must cling to, focus on, and not give up. Number one, your life is to glorify Christ. Now, I'll come back to this at the very end. I'm not going to go far. Glorify Christ. Friendship with the world will cause you to live a secret life that does not glorify the Lord. You cannot glorify the Lord secretly. You cannot glorify the Lord by giving mixed signals to people around you, by compromising with the world. You cannot glorify Christ without taking a stand. Number two, love the brethren. The Bible says in the end times, the love of many will grow cold. Love for family, love for God, love for the brethren. We're to love all people, but we are to love those of the household of faith more. Amen. First. Amen. And we are to find our fellowship and our affection there. Amen. It's where we're to, to go to have our friendships and where we are to find comfort with one another. And so we are to care for others, but we are to pour our hearts out because we're going to need each other during this time. Number three, share the gospel. Share the gospel. I've talked about we just went through the last days, and I mean through the, the church on earth and the tribulation, and I've talked about the hiding place. There is a hiding place. But we're not to hide right now. We're not called right now to hide. Christians are already hiding before it's time. We're not to hide. We're not to put our light under a basket. And we're not to be a city that is hidden. We're to be the city on the hill. We are called to take a stand. That means that we are to speak up. Amen. When other things are said that Amen. we want to cower and we want to go... Get in a closet. We go to the closet to get in the secret place with God so that yes. we can come out like a lion. Yes. We are to represent Amen. the lion Amen. of the tribe of Judah. Amen. Share the gospel. Yes. Friendship with the world will cause you to be filled with fear of someone else not accepting you right. or what you say. Beloved, we are still called to take a stand. Yes, in this are. last hour. Yes. Still called to take a stand yes. and not to hide. 
verses 15 through 17. <clears throat> 15 through 17, he tells them, the men tell them to get up and to escape. Get up and to escape. We are looking at a culture around us that while the word says we are in the world, but we are not of the world. So for us, it is our mind that we need to take and escape from those things. Our hearts, our affections, we need to run from it. What does the Bible say uh, in the Psalms that a, a young man should flee lust, youthful lust? We're to flee the things that would cause us to be in disobedience to the Lord. In the last verses we read, he, he doesn't want to explicitly obey. Oh, we haven't read that yet, have we? Verse 18. Then Lot said to them, Please know, my lords, indeed now your servant has found favor in your sight, and you have increased your mercy, which you have shown me by saving my life. Listen, to this. this is what I say. He's still, he just can't help it. They've given him explicit directions to flee to the mountains. Same thing Jesus said about the last days. But I cannot escape to the mountains, lest some evil overtake me and I die. He's lived in the company of worldly men so long that he thinks he can't survive out in the mountains like Abraham. He can't survive out on his own. He has to have a town. See now, this city is near enough to flee to, and it is a little one. Please let me escape there. Is it not a little one? And my soul shall live. Jesus said, he who saves his own soul will lose it. So he's conflicted even though he is obedient to flee the city and God has great mercy on him. Grace is being poured out on him and he's brought out to this small town where he goes to get away from the destruction that is falling all around on Sodom and Gomorrah. In verses 23 through 26, we come to the actual heart of the message this morning. All the other was preparation. The sun had risen upon the earth when Lot entered Zoar. Then the Lord rained down brimstone and fire on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of the heavens. And it's not just Sodom and Gomorrah. For verse 25 says, so he overthrew those cities, all the plain, all the inhabitants of the cities, and what grew on the ground. But his wife looked back behind him, because remember he said, don't look back. The angel said, do not look back. But his wife looked back behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. And Abraham went early in the morning to the place where he had stood before the Lord, then he looked toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the plain, and he saw and behold the smoke of the land, which went up like the smoke of a furnace. And it came to pass, when God destroyed the cities of the plain, that God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow, when he overthrew the cities in which Lot had dwelt. As Lot is leaving Sodom and he is fleeing the city, with his family. Lot's wife. Lot's wife is the picture that I want you to look at today because she is a picture of a believer who has gone part way with God. How many of you know a part time Christian cannot face a full time devil? That's right. She's gone part way with God. She's gone part way out of the city. She, the city is a picture of God's judgment, His wrath upon sin. And you're going to see it's a picture of the cross. God's wrath is poured out upon sin in Sodom. She has been given the grace to escape. Does that sound familiar to any yes. of you? Yes. yes God's does. wrath has been announced against sin, but we have been given grace to escape. Yes. Yes. The destruction that he promised upon sin. Thank you, Lord. He has graciously delivered Lot, and Lot's wife comes with him. But at some point, the magnetism of the sin, the lifestyle, the world, the things of the world, 
are so much that she cannot, she just cannot help it. And she turns around and she looks back. And the Bible it is implying here she is looking back longingly at what she is leaving behind. She looks back longingly and the judgment falls upon her. She becomes a pillar of salt. Her loyalty, her friendship, you see the scriptures we began with speak of the friendship with the world. Her friendship with the city of Sodom comes first. It's so great that she cannot resist it. And the one command kind of reminds me of the Garden of Eden. One command. Isn't it funny how we can be given one command? And that one thing is so hard. Don't look back. Don't look back. Did you get saved at some point in your life? I'm asking the people of God this morning, did you truly get saved Amen. at some point in your life? Amen. Can you look back to a time that you put your faith in Christ and you believed the truth of the gospel yes. and that God poured out His wrath upon His own Son? And the Bible says that God was in Christ reconciling the world to Himself. The wrath of God was unleashed in all of its fury against the sinfulness of all of mankind placed upon Christ on the cross of Calvary for you and I. Did you believe that? Yes. Did you come to that? Did you yes. put your hope and your trust yes. in Him? Did you repent of your sins? Yes. And did you turn? Yes. And now have you found yourself in a place halfway between there and the place that God wants you to be? And you still have friendship with the things that you su were supposed to leave behind. How many Christians in here have reserved a little bit of the sin of the past for up here in the thought palace, the mind palace? Nobody sees you acting upon it. Nobody sees that you live that lifestyle anymore. In fact, you don't. But up here in your mind, you have a place reserved that you can go to and you can relive it. Anywhere and any time that you choose. It's so private. No one else can see it. And you can revisit that thing. You can, you can begin to long for it. You can be like the children of Israel. When they came out of Egypt and they were hungry and they were thirsty. And they began to complain to Moses and say, it was better in Egypt. We had food. How many Christians are saying in their heart, oh, it was better in the world. I didn't have to worry about being ostracized. I didn't have to worry about whether I was going counter to the culture and whether they were going to persecute me or not. And so you find yourself at this place where you're looking back. One command, do not look back. Do not look back. She looks back longingly at what God has judged. I want you to truly get this picture. Because if you're doing that, you're looking back at, the, at what God has already put on His Son on the cross. You look longingly at the world and the things of the world, and you're drawn, maybe things from your past still want to draw you back. And you begin to look back and you begin to entertain that, or form some allegiance with it. You're looking back at the Son of God, judged with the wrath of God against sin, and you're longing for it. It's a great spiritual picture for us. Remember these words. Friendship with the world is hostility towards God. Hostility towards God. I don't want any place in my heart to be hostile towards God. It's a picture of the gospel. God sending His Son to be the recipient of His wrath, receiving that wrath that we deserved, our sin. See, the city was cons consumed with the fire, the judgment of God. Our sin was consumed on the cross of Calvary by the Amen. wrath of God Amen. to draw us out from under that judgment. She was, listen to me, she was drawn out of that judgment and then could not resist looking back. And then she received the judgment. Yes. 
Because either Jesus takes our judgment or we take our judgment. Yes. One or the other. Her sympathies lay in Sodom. Lot's wife is a picture of the believer who has escaped the fiery judgment and wrath of God by coming to him through faith. Yet when it comes down to it, they long for the company of the world. They long for the friendship of sinners. They long for the things that they once treasured, the things that God has condemned. Especially the sins that they enjoyed and that God put upon his son. He says that she looked back and became a pillar of salt. In the Bible there's like seven different things about salt that we're not going to look at. But one of the main meanings and significances of salt is that salt is used as part of covenant making and friendship. People would cut a covenant with salt, and we won't go into that. I'm narrowing it down. But people would, there's a whole saying that if you share a meal with someone, then they're your friend. And in the Old Testament, it was if you shared salt. Salt was valuable. It was so valuable at times in history it's been used as money. It's not something that they could just readily gather. It was a treasure. It brought taste to food. It preserved things. All manner of different significant things concerning salt. But here it is a picture of friendship. Her friendship was with Sodom. And so she became a pillar of salt. An emblem of where her friendship lay. There she was, left as only a pillar of salt as a reminder. She was preserved by salt. Preserved by salt as a reminder that her loyalty and her friendship with evil was judged by God. And the Bible saying indirectly, she was hostile towards God. Jesus' words in Luke say, he says in one place, he says, remember Lot's wife. Whoever saves his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will gain eternal life. She was looking back longing to preserve her natural life and all that went with it. And in so doing, she lost everything. I want to close by going back to the three things that I gave you and just by challenging you to let the Holy Spirit speak to your own heart. The Lord doesn't give me a word like this unless we need it. There are those perhaps who are struggling with this place that is, we call it halfway or a halfway Christian, but there's the Bible, there's no such thing. He describes this carnal place, but in the end, the Bible never answers the question concerning this. We stand and we see someone in that place be, be overcome, and we shake our, we scratch our heads, we shake our heads, and we say, well, were, were they never a Christian in the first place? If they were a Christian, how did they turn back like that? Or were they a Christian, and you can be a Christian, and you can just compromise like that, and God still has such grace for you. We're not to, we're not to make a formula out of this, because if we do, we'll lean upon the formula and think that we're okay. I can imagine Lot's wife coming out of the city and coming to the top of a hill and she's like, well, you know, my husband sat in the city gate every single day and God had grace on us and brought us out. And he was clearly in sin. And she probably thought to herself, I know God loves me. He understands. I just want one last look. I just want to look one more time. And we deceive ourselves. Glorify Christ. Take that and pray about it. How will you live in this culture and glorify Christ? I'm here to challenge you today. If you think that you can do that silently, it cannot be done. Glorify Christ in word and deed. That means... Let your life line up with everything that you see in the Word of God where it's not lined up as the Holy Spirit begins to speak to you about it. 
Give those things over to the Lord and, and come into alignment. Glorify Christ. Let the kind of life that you live bring honor to the Lord. Number two, again, love the brethren. You see that compromise with the world? I'm not pointing fingers at anybody because it's rampant right now. And so I'm not talking about any one of you individually. But throughout the church, our church and the other churches, there is so much compromise with the world that the value upon the Sunday morning assembly of God is almost gone. It's, well, it's like multiple choice. Today, am I going to stay home with the family? Or am I going to go to church? Or am I going to go buy groceries, A, B, C? Or let's go to the park or whatever for the day. Which do I feel like? the most. When the conviction in the Word of God is that we belong together to come together, not just Sundays, but that is the minimum, but to come together and to worship God, to instruct, to train, and do all of the things that the church can only do when they come together in person. We are to be a part of it. Forsake not the assembling of the people of God. The assembly. God's assembly is forsaken and there's no love for the brethren. No love for the brethren. Jesus said, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples, that you love one another. I think it starts with being together, loving the assembly. And the third one, share the gospel. Share the gospel. Be ready, the Bible says, in season and out of season to give a reason for the hope that lies within you. Well, you know, if you're friends with the world and you're not doing number one and glorifying Christ with your life, nobody's going to even see that there's any hope in your heart. So why will they ask? Why are you always so filled with hope? What is it that there's a smile, there's a joy within you? There's something different about you. If you're friends with the world, that all gets canceled. No one will believe you. You think that people, <laughs> the church thought that the people around them in the world wanted to see them relate to them more and be more like them and make the church more like them. And so the church in the last 30, 40, 50 years did surveys to see what the community wanted, the unsafe community, and tailored their church programs in order to appeal to them to bring them into the church. And they have found out since then that the world looks at the church and says, you don't even do what you believe. You're just a bunch of compromisers. And so they gravitate towards something like Islam or yoga or something that requires discipline. And someone to tell them, this is, this is something you should do because it's right. The world is hungry. There's a lot of hostility. There are people that are just simply falling apart. Their lives are wrecked. And the church, the people of God, not, not an organization, the people of God have the living bread, the living water. They have the life from above. They have what people need if their lives are separate from the world and they have power from on high. They have something to offer. Amen. This morning, where do your affections and your sympathies lie? Have you accepted the things around you and are you finding your friendship that you're drawn to those in the world or you're drawn to the people of God and to the Word of God, to whom are you loyal? To whom are you loyal?